Welcome to Sustain What, a series of conversations seeking solutions where complexity and consequence collide. That's basically on just about every sustainability frontier, from shaping a safer relationship with Earth's climate to building more civil online relationships with each other. As we say here in the Communication Initiative of the Columbia Climate School, the word sustainability has no meaning on its own. The first step toward success is to ask, sustain what, how, and for whom? This program contains audio highlights from hundreds of video webcasts, which you can explore on your own at j.mp slash sustainwhatlive. I'm Dale Willman, Associate Director of Columbia's Initiative on Communication and Sustainability. The webcast was created and is hosted most of the time by Andy Revkin, the longtime environmental journalist, sometime songwriter, and founding director of the initiative. Read his related dispatches at revkin.bulletin.com. And now, sustain what? Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. Sadly, still wrapped in a pandemic, surging in many places. I've seen reports from Uganda, from, of course, Europe, and of course, here in the United States. It, hopefully, people are not getting lulled by the idea that the vaccine is going to be distributed swiftly. We can all relax because that's not how this works. Uh, we are in a pathogenic world and we're all hyperconnected. So stay safe wherever you are. I'm Andy Revkin. This is the Earth Institute Sustain What webcast. It's been going since March 15th, since day one of lockdown for me. And uh, the, we focus um, on building solution-focused conversations uh, when complexity and consequence collide. And I can't think of an issue that has those characteristics more than the climate challenge, which of course I've been dug in on since the mid to late eighties um, and still haven't, what's that U2 song? I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You know, we're all grappling with an issue that has characteristics that are way beyond imagination and actually that's what makes today's conversation so special. The, we're talking about Ministry for the Future, the new book by an epic, sprawling, prismatic, ultimately hopeful, sometimes chaotic account of, of our moment with the climate system. And uh, we're gonna try to kind of dig in on what the lessons are here and how do we get the future into the room, essentially. The future is in this room today because um, I've got three people here who think about this all the time in different ways. Uh, there, there's, there are two ways to kind of integrate the future into current decision making, really. One is scenarios. What, I, what do I think is likely to happen? What are some possibilities? And what can you do today to limit that? Or to get the future in the room, which is what we're doing today with Alexandria Villasenor, who at the, the tender age of 15, even when she was younger, in 2018, she was one of the pioneers of the Fridays for Future uh, climate uh, um, protests and strikes. I first met her at the UN on her bench, and uh, she's had some interesting relationships with Columbia University through her mother, learning about sustainability. And it's great to have you here, uh, Alexandra Villasenor from Davis, California. And of course, Kim Stanley Robinson, the a novelist who I think has written more words about climate futures than anyone, including the IPCC. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think maybe well maybe the IPCC has you be beat. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Those are definitely even thicker. Um, the IPCC reports um, and, and Stan's new book again, Ministry for the Future. It's very unusual for him because it takes us only up to like 2035, as opposed to 2200 or well beyond, and and, and it's, it's strictly on this planet and not on Mars and elsewhere. Great to have you here, uh, Stan, and it's seems like ages since you both were at Columbia back in February as this disease was spreading around um, and we unknowingly were at the latter stages of having face-to-face -face meetings. Yeah. And and Carolyn, Carolyn Raffensperger is here as well, who I first got to know way back in 2007 when I wrote a piece on my blog um, on the idea, let me just go to it, it'd be fun to see it. One second. Uh, does the future need a legal guardian? And Carolyn is a lawyer, and she'll tell you more about her work now. Um, she's in Iowa, 
And she was asserting then that uh, the United States needs a policy. We need a place, a, a person, a, a process through which the future is respected in present lawmaking. And that was for a recommendation for president. It would have been Obama ultimately that year. And we'll, we'll find out how it's going. But now let's just get into the conversation a little bit. I want to start with um, with Stan and the book, um, which I have been exploring and see all my stickers and questions. It, it's, it's a remarkable adventure, sort of a literary, literary adventure where you're, you're jerked one second to the next from a poem to a, a riddle to um, a little autobiography of a carbon dioxide molecule to this narrative, this, this, these narratives that entwine the lives of, of um, a UN worker and, uh, and a radical, radicalized uh, climate campaigner. It's got geoengineering. It's got all these. To me, what's interesting about it is it reflects that there's no single path to our climate future, whatever, whatever you think your path might be. It has this. It has everything in it. It's got law, finance, geo, uh, sucking the water out from under the great ice sheets. So, so Kim, does that reflect? What does that reflect about your view of this puzzle? Um, is this not a simple? single path? What's the what's the crux there? Well, a couple of things. Um, it's what sometimes gets called a wicked problem in that it's so interrelated with um, different factors that you describe that um, um, there's no one strand that will lead you through the maze. And then the other factor is that I think that we are getting into um, desperate times where we really need to act fast so that I've been saying it's an all hands on deck situation so that any of the solutions um, that we might think of for dealing with climate change, uh, they all need to be on the table and under serious consideration, including ones that are um, not in good repute right now. Um, but maybe they need to be reconsidered that we're in an all hands on deck situation. And I wanted to describe, and you use the word, the, the chaos of the near future. It isn't going to feel comfortable. It isn't, there isn't going to be a single straightforward story. Um, and I organized it under some, under this rubric of the ministry for the future with, with the idea that we need to be thinking about what's happening to the point of giving it legal standing. And I'll be very interested to hear, what uh, Carolyn has to say about this, because of course um, a, a legal guardian for something implies that that something has legal standing. And so like in Wales, there's a ministry for the future for the country of Wales. Uh, Ecuador has uh, legal rights given to its uh, forest and its constitution. We see these precursors. And so what I wanted to do was try to tell that story in, an, in a fully international setting as a global, um, uh, situation and and go with the chaos and see what kind of story came out of it with all these forms that you're talking about. So that's more or less how it came about. Well, it it's uh, it, again, it's a remarkable achievement, and I'll be diving in many, many, many more times to to get at the crux of it. There was one line in the book that I think really kind of articulates. Perhaps maybe you can answer this. What I see is your hope. You know, sometimes fiction is just what it is. It's a story. Sometimes it's got some sense of a aspiration to change people. And I don't know where, where you fall in, 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 that, in those categories. You could talk about that. But this line uh, from one of these mini chapters, uh, which was one of the riddles, uh, I really liked. I, this is in the voice of the, 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 the question is ambiguous. I happen in the present, but I'm told only in the future. I am history. Now make me good. That's the part that really felt interesting, you know, having written about this idea of a good Anthropocene or, mm -hmm. you, you know, what do we do? Is, is this an aspirational point or is that too simplistic? No, it is aspirational, but um, the, this notion of a good Anthropocene is important. It's a good phrase <clears throat> and needs to be spread widely because we are in the Anthropocene. It is uh, demonstrable by uh, different strands of scientific inquiry that, um, uh, in 
in 25 million years from now, if they look back into the history of the Earth's geology, they are going to be able to see humanity's mark on the landscape, possibly by a mass extinction event, the fossil remains of that, and then by a whole bunch of other factors, including the, the nuclear explosions of the 40s and 50s. So, okay, we're in the Anthropocene, but that doesn't mean um, anything determinative as to whether it's going to be good or bad and in terms of history for the biosphere and for humanity. Uh, although we are not good at it yet, the, the project of, um, of not so much planetary management, but planetary um, cooperation to fit ourselves into the biosphere into a sustainable and just way, well, that's the project of the Anthropocene. And if we did that, then we would have a good Anthropocene. So it, it, Anthropocene is not equal, instantly equatable to doom for the biosphere, which I think is one of the kind of common uh, understandings of it. So I, I think uh, the project of a good Anthropocene is also what the Ministry for the Future is about. What would that look like? It wouldn't be simple. It wouldn't be straightforward. It isn't going to be success after success because we really are on a on a trajectory towards a mass extinction event and getting off that trajectory is going to be difficult and uh, there's going to be a lot of opposition to it by other people that don't see the story the same way. Um, so it's going to be a contested process that in this book I sometimes call it the war for the earth, which is another popular title like Ministry for the Future. It isn't quite right, but it it, it captures some aspect of the situation. We are in, a, in an immense struggle that is material and um, philosophical for the fate of the biosphere. So that's really what, uh, what, what fighting for a good Anthropocene is all about. And, you know, this is a good segue to our other guests here, Alexandria and Carolyn, because there's a, this other concept in the book that you articulate pretty clearly. I was, I was looking for my sticker. I couldn't find it. Um, which is that there are these people, who, oh, there's a Hebrew concept of people who are guardians or safeguards of civilization, but who are hidden and don't even know each other necessarily. They're just out there sprinkled. And when I think of Carolyn's work as a lawyer and Alexandria's work as a young activist and, and the technologists working on ice sheet physics, and it feels to me sometimes like that really is a fundamental aspect of this. And it's also kind of chaotic. Again, it's not just, it's like if you have enough people scattered around with enough motivation, things start to coalesce. Is that mm -hmm. part of what's in your head here? Well, I would hope so. Uh, say that there's 8 billion people, we're not quite there, but if you say that, then you could also say that everybody has uh, one eight billionth of the responsibility. <laughs> um, and, and it's not true that everybody has an equal amount of power, but um, we are all agents in this world and making the history of 2020, 2021. We make that history together by what we do collectively and individually. So there is this individual component. And <clears throat> there are elements in nature where a part per billion is um, you know, extremely effective as a, as a poison or as a stimulant usually. But um, there are uh, uh, chemical elements where in the parts per billion you have an effect. And so that's what I think history has to be considered as, is something that right now everybody is connected um, more or less. So there, are, there are the immiserated, <clears throat> maybe two billion are disconnected, but they still know what's going on and they still act in the world. So, but for the connected people who know what's going on, our actions do matter as individuals. It's just that they have to aggregate. And that's where you have to hope that the, that the word is spreading, that the example is being taken up, that kind of thing. So let's go to Alexandria and the voice of the future. As I said earlier, there's two ways to get the future in the room. One is through envisioning and the other is through giving voice to people who will occupy it a lot more than, than we will, the other three people here. So Alexandria, you, you know, this is a big sprawling book and you've been focused on school too. I'm not sure if you've been able to dig into the whole thing, but when you think about this question, the climate question from your, from your vantage point, you know, what, what resonates with what you've been hearing here? You know, I think that it's really interesting, you know, talking about this because I feel like a lot of the work that I've been doing when it comes to climate activism is we've had to use all sorts of storylines and messaging to really narrate the climate crisis. And one thing that I talk about a lot is that 
uh, climate scientists are needed because activists are there to push forward the message. And it's this partnership that happens. Climate scientists tell us the science and activists really push it out. And so, you know, being kind of this voice of the future, um, you know, I think it's kind of weird living so much of my life in the future because, you know, that's essentially what an activist is doing. We're someone who is advocating for change that will come now and in, in the future in the next coming years as well. And so I definitely do think that climate activism work is a lot slower than I would have thought and imagined. And so being a teenager, that's really all um, I want is everything now is to get this action now. And I think that that's one thing about youth climate activists too, is that, I mean, we're teenagers, you can say we don't have any patience. And so that's why we organize so much. And so um, a lot of action, like which doesn't happen as quickly as we want it to when we're trying to change the whole world. And so it's especially frustrating when we're working on climate change, because not only is the problem the most important one of the planet, but also we have to be patient, though. We have to learn that. And our generation isn't really built for that sort of patience. And that's that's part of this push me, pull you mm. struggle in a way. I think um, every, every voice, elder, youth, matters in terms of driving some kind of pressure in a certain direction. It seems to me about directionality in the end. You know, mm -hmm. Carolyn using her legal expertise, which you'll hear about in a second. You getting in people's faces. I'll, I'll never forget the chant at the UN when Greta got here by boat and there was, we vote next, we vote next. Mm -hmm. you, and you do. <laughs> so that's like, uh, hopefully those signals all resonate. Uh, mm -hmm. Carolyn Raffensperger, can you kind of draw a little picture of what drew you into this question of representing the future? I can, but first I, I wanna mention that I'm speaking from Iowa. Um, and uh, you make some deft references to Iowa or, or my part of the world um, in your wonderful, wonderful book, Stan. Um, it's the home of the Leopold Center. Uh, you called it the Leopold Institute in your book. Um, but we are also the most ecologically damaged state in the union. Mm -hmm. And I uh, live on where the Iowa Indians used to live, um, the indigenous people, Sioux, and others. Um, and I'm also where the derecho hit. So Sorry. in terms of climate uh, effects, drought, flooding, and now I think the most uh, uh, alarming are the increased winds. Um, we have had more wind advisories than I could even imagine. And what brought me to this was early work that I did on toxic chemicals um, and looking at a different way of making decisions. Um, so you talk about cost benefit analysis in, in your book uh, and risk assessment, and that's how we basically make environmental decisions. And uh, one of my uh, colleagues asked me early on in my work with the Science and Environmental Health Network, if there were other ways to make those decisions. And I discovered the precautionary principle. And so held a big conference on it to figure out how to make that wonderful decision-making tool something that we could actually put into place. And my indigenous friends with the Indigenous Environmental Network and elsewhere kept sidling up to me and standing next to me, leaning their head over and saying, you know, that's the seventh generation rule. And okay, that, that's all well and good. And I didn't really know what that meant. And one of my friends uh, with IEN asked if I would do uh, some work on the pebble mine to try and block that gold mine. And he asked how we put the precautionary principle together with the seventh generation rule. And I said, we designate a legal guardian for future generations who can speak uh, as their legal representative about the consequences and intervene in that decision. And we instantly knew that that had some of the hallmarks of a good decision. One is it had some mythic uh, elements, the guardian, um, that really, you know, you could have a comic book about it. It had legal hooks already in that we can designate guardians for children. Um, and it had a biological truth to it in that we want future generations to continue. And so all of those elements make for a good policy idea, at least in my mind. So we immediately went to Harvard Law School Center for International Human Rights because we wanted to move environmental law 
out of environmental law and free market private property law into rights law. Mm. So we did this elaborate project on uh, future generations um, with Harvard's uh, law school. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of law that we could move environmental law into. We could move it into family law, which is in some ways what uh, a legal guardian for future generations do, does. We've been talking with some of my indigenous friends now who are working to stop the Keystone Pipeline or Enbridge Line 3. I was a lawyer on Dakota Access Pipeline. And what we're trying to do there is rethink the relationship to the Missouri River or to wild rice and that these are actually relatives. And if we treated them as relatives in the law, like we treat children or parents or grandparents or spouses, what would it look like? But in that instant of designating a legal guardian for future generations, we knew that we could begin to give standing to future generations. And there are a number of experiments that have been run, run around the world. Um, whether it's a commissioner for future generation or an ombudsman, an ombudsman doesn't have the same ring to it. <laughs> um, we have ombudsmen in the United States for small business at the Department of Justice. So we could do things like this. And out of that um, work, uh, you know, the question is, what is government for? It's not a question that you address um, uh, in your book. Um, and it's one that gave rise to some ideas, at least for me, in that, you know, right now, the premise is that government is essentially for the economy. And I, I think you referenced that a lot in your economic um, uh, underpinnings of your novel. But if we rethought what government was fundamentally about, that it was for the well-being of people, that it was a reflected a moral maturity of a culture and a society, that we would uh, do many, many different things. You listed all of the different kinds of indices for measuring happiness or all of those. But if we actually said it was a measure of the effectiveness of government and that goal, the responsibility was well-being rather than the economy, we might shift a whole lot of things. So the the question I've got is why are we putting so much imagination into technology and so little into governance, into new ways of thinking about the economy? Into, you know, we, we've had uh, EPA for a long time. What other ways can we go about this? Uh, ben but Franklin invented the first library and the first fire department. What are we going to do? Where's our inventiveness? That's, boy, you've hit on some great questions, points there. Um, the most important to me was that idea of moving the environment from sort of property law history toward <clears throat> to rights law. That's a fair, such a fundamental rethinking. And it relates to the reality of that we live in this system it's called the environment. And it's not property or it just feels really rich. And the question is, I guess path dependency is a word that comes to mind all the time when I think about what Alexandria said earlier about the urgency <laughs> And then recognizing the world is hard and complex and and you're describing a, a process of breaking some norms that are so deep rooted. It feels challenging. That doesn't mean we give up on it. Um, I just wanted to reference one particular paper. It was actually 2007 when Kelly Levin was still a graduate student at Yale. Uh, she wrote, started writing a paper, a series of papers on this, overcoming the tragedy of super wicked problems, constraining our future selves to ameliorate global climate change. You know, liberating the future by constraining ourselves today. And again, it feels so right. And it also feels so hard. Maybe, maybe uh, Stan, if you want to react to some of this so far, and then, and then Alexandria too, it'd be great. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Carolyn. I, I love all of it. I, by a weird coincidence, I was driving across Iowa on the day of the derecho uh, back in August and it was on highway 80 and it was a most awesome experience. Um, wow. We didn't understand. My wife and I um, thought, well, I was a very windy place. <clears throat> we didn't know it was a, an exceptionally uh, unusual day, but there will be more of those. And I'm very much uh, uh, taken by this idea of um, rights law and the seven generations. This is very important. Um, 
<clears throat> and to me, I always think of government as being um, of the people, by the people, and for the people in every way uh, you can imagine that uh, going forward. Um, and I would hope that all these things would proceed on a kind of coherent basis that then would change the economics. Because we do um, apply a rubric that is quantitative and mathematical, we, we rate the future with a discount rate that w would change if these other moral considerations or for welfare considerations were brought into place. So I remain in interested in everything as it's operating now. And I was, I was thinking about what Alexandria was saying and I was uh, imagining, um, okay, Alexandria is 15. By the time you are my age, um, I mean, I'll be long gone, but uh, you'll be my age. That will be, what, 2070, 2075. The world will be a very different place by then, necessarily. And it will take that whole time, uh, your entire life, will be in a period of disruption and change, necessary change to, to decarbonize fast enough to, that, the, that the climate change impacts, the biosphere um, damage won't be too severe. And we'll, you'll be handing on to the young people in your time a, a, a world with um, a, a better looking future than the one that we're looking at right now. So there's a kind of bend of the curve of history into a better trajectory that will take the entirety of your lives. And well, this, is, this means that being impatient about it is really impossible. It's a lifelong um, a struggle. And that it seems to me is an exhausting thought. And what I wanna say is that the, the activists, the people that are out there in the streets and banging the drums and in the face of government to demand change, that's a wave action where uh, people can do that with the full enthusiasm of their life for what, five years, and then you need the next wave to come along and take your place on the streets while you figure out things to do that are like what Carolyn has done, um, integrated into the changing of the laws, because I think it's the changing of the laws that we're really gonna need here. This is the technology. When when Carolyn talks about why, aren't, why are we focusing in on technologies that are essentially machine or, or uh, mechanical technologies, the, the sense of technology should be expanded out to systems because, and we know this because of our computers, software is crucial. It's not just a hunk of metal and plastic, it's the software. Well, software in society at large is the law and, and language and justice, uh, people's rights. So these are all technologies, it's just that they're software technologies and they do need rapid reconfigurations and, re and upgrades uh, to, in order to make them more appropriate to our time. But um, what I find interesting to contemplate, and this is a kind of a science fiction writer thing that I'll end with, is, is the year 2075 is going to be really, really interesting. And you'll be there to see it uh, uh, with luck. And that will be, um, you'll, my grandfather used to say um, to me, I had the most amazing life. When I began, we were in horse and buggies, and I just watched somebody land on the moon. So this was a rather astonishing lifetime, you know, 1900 to uh, 1980. And you're going to have a similarly um, astonishing uh, life arc in terms of change in world history. It's inevitable because we're in such a dangerous spot right now. So that's a heavy uh, load to, to, to carry, Alexandria. When you, what, how, what keeps you going every morning? I know you've been twe tweeting ferociously about the state of things these days. One thing that I want to just offer to you too is that social media, for all of its faults, seems to be a prime driver of the capacity of your, all of your organizations, Earth Uprising Now and, and the Fridays for Future hashtag activism to organize across the world in ways that were inconceivable 10 years ago. So technology, at least information technology, feels like it can give you some outsized capacity yeah, on the that's on the upside, and then of course there are all these challenges on the downside. So where does that leave you, you these days? Yeah, you know, first off, I quickly want to touch on some things that have been said here before, and especially to um, Carolyn's point as well when you're talking about the seventh generation rule. 
I, I want to say that the youth climate movement, we see indigenous cosmology as having the answer, answers to so much of the climate crisis, like indigenous communities relationship with fire, especially here in California, because after this year of horrible wildfires and record breaking wildfires, our government is now realizing that prescribed burning is safer and takes better care of the land than our policies of fire suppression that we've had for decades. And so that's the difference in the relationship with the land where the land is respected in a different way than our culture regards the land right now. Um, and I also quickly want to add too that to Stan, um, I actually wanted to say that I'm reading the Ministry for the Future. And I remember when my mom was taking some of her climate science classes and she ended up teaching me about the temperature of the wet bulb as a 15 year old, my dad. Mm -hmm which is what Stan is writing about in that chapter with the heat wave. And so for over a year, I wouldn't let my mom talk about it because it gave me nightmares. So, but the first chapter in the oh book, God, a chapter. In a, the first chap chapter of the book tells it in a different way that is more personal. So while I was like, no mom, don't tell me anymore about science, please. It was actually easier to learn about in a fiction and in a narrative than it was through hard science. And so my generation needs to create more of those narratives of the future in order to educate ourselves about the future you're talking about so that we can be prepared and we can adapt. And so also kind of touching on the technology, social media has been so helpful to the movements all around. And especially when the youth climate movement, when we went into the lockdown, um, we started to really um, change our tactics which and build our new structures and recruit and start training, building new relationships. But social media was the key grounding that kept our movement going because we would work online through social media, through videos, through op-eds and petitions and all kinds of digital activism and awareness campaigns. And so without technology, our movement would look very different right now. So that's, that's a good jumping point to get back into the book, because there's an element in the book that's different than Carolyn's work and different than your work. It's really hardcore terrorism. It's uh, the guy, Frank, and others who, uh, the something of Kali, the, the Kali group who, uh, there's crash day when essentially all airplanes are demolished in a single event. Uh, there's the kidnapping of the key character, Mary, and uh, it, it gets to a point of, that feeling almost like if that isn't part of it, the other stuff wouldn't fall into place. So, so Stan, is that, do you think things have to get to that point? Are we, you know, again, it's a novel. It's not like a menu or recommendation or conclusion, but what does that say about the intensity of the question? <clears throat> well, you bring up a troubling point and I have to say immediately that um, uh, what I would advocate, advocate for are actions like Alexandria's and like Carolyn's, that we change the laws as fast as possible by nonviolent action. And this is the best way for it to happen. Um, I'm worried that there are uh, forces in this world, the people who wanted to build that pebble mine that Carolyn fought against, a particularly egregious example of short-term greed destroying the biosphere, that um, strand in our society is still amazingly strong given that those actors know the same things that we know. I am astonished. And there are people who are going to be furious, who are at the sharp end of the stick. Um, the people in this world are already suffering the damage of climate change in their lives. And they are going to be righteously outraged to the point of taking uh, action that sometimes will be violent action. So I'm glad you pointed out that my book is a novel. It's not a set of recommendations. It's not a blueprint. It's an attempt to describe um, a plausible future that you can believe in that nevertheless gets to a kind of best case scenario. And so I fear that, uh, well, I fear the wet bulb um, 35 uh, temperature event that is coming and will be devastating. I fear the kind of uh, eco-terrorism uh, that might uh, uh, follow that. And um, I w what I would hope is that when you contemplate these futures, 
bearing down on us that you would uh, in by after reading the book work even harder towards the uh, legal and activist ways to uh, get change fast. So that's it's it's been a very troubling aspect of the book. It's been widely remarked upon, you know, as if I made up a uh, you know, uh, political violence uh, out of my head. Uh, I, like Rod Serling used to get uh, accused of inventing the idea of taking airlines hostage. Um, and I always thought that was a little bit unfair. Um, and it's not a point of pride when a storyteller gets tagged as the inventor of um, violent deeds. I would prefer nonviolent resistance that is effective and fast. I think those... And if I could respond about what is the law, the law is the set of rules that a community agrees to be bound by. And what they were saying is we do not agree to be bound by these. And when you get a vast gulf between justice and the law, the law must fall. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we saw is that a state is actually follows the rule of law. And in a failed state where the law no longer protects its, its, the residents and that they have agreed to be bound by those rules that will fall. And then you get a stateless society and how you maintain peace in a stateless society is reciprocity. You know, the gift, Marcel Mauss wrote the gift, um, mm -hmm. and that, that uh, gift economy. And when that all breaks down, then what you get is a kind of justice that looks like violence, um, but is, is actually a form of justice. And you grapple with justice in your book, in your, in your novel. And I want to say one other thing about the law. The law changes the slowest of all cultural artifacts. Fashion changes very fast. So the people who are the scientists in, in adaptive management who are working to restore and reclaim natural systems um, talk about case layering, you know, what changes more quickly. The law changes the slowest of all things. And so we have to use every single other means of change before those slow gears of the law change. But we have to have some imagination about where that law might go um, and how to get there in order to you know, get that solid infrastructure in place that are the rules that we've agreed to be bound by. So. Uh, and I want to say to you, Alexandria, I do not believe that patience is a virtue. It might be necessary, but it is not necessarily a virtue. And all of the agitation that, you know, uh, around time is short is important. So you may have to have patience because, as we've all pointed out, this is a lifetime of work. Um, some of us have been at it for a very, very long time. And so get everything you need for the resilience for the long haul. It is a, a marathon and you've got ancestors behind you who are supporting you and cheering you on. And when we are dead, we will still be cheering you on. That's a powerful call. You know, that gets at this idea of, um, um, well, Michael Mann, the climate scientist has a book coming out in January. And he and I have had some debates off and on about how to characterize the climate problem and what to do, but we agree very emotionally, powerfully on, I used to say, I started saying 10 years ago, we need uh, urgency, but patience. That's what I said 10 years ago. And then he, in his new book, he calls it, he says, urgency and agency, agency. And that means for your cohort, engagement in the power process, the political process. And that's, I think, a good aspect of what you're trying to do, I think. So, and I like that urgency and agency because that gives you the sense of there is, this is a methodical path forward, but you got to have the voices in the room. And of course, with climate, the other voices are the, those who are most vulnerable and least responsible for the climate problem to begin with, which is part of the dynamic that's in uh, Stan's book. This, uh, the, it's not a class war, it's a climate impacts versus responsibility war at a big scale. India takes on its own solutions you know, in a unitary way. And those dynamics are so interesting. Alexandria, over to you. Yeah, I, what was the question? Well, just here? about agency. I, I guess I'm just, I think uh, Carolyn and I are both just cheering you on, <laughs> essentially. 
But we also have to facilitate you having agency, getting you in the room. Definitely. I think that this um, one thing that I've been focusing a lot on is, of course, education. And so um, agency is so important. And one thing that I found with a lot of young people, especially after um, organizing the climate strikes all throughout 2019, was that there was a lot of young people not getting involved in climate activism because they didn't really know why it was important. And so with my organization, Earth Uprising, we're focusing a lot in this upcoming year on educating young people peer-to-peer um, -peer in schools. And so through that, when young people are educated, they feel passionate. And so when they're passionate, making sure that we get them into those rooms and lobby their politicians and make their voices heard because the passion drives them. And so I've actually have a couple examples of, um, of what when people want young people to get into the room, um, good examples are, for example, um, all the way back when the debates first started for this past election, um, Jay Inslee's campaign, when he was uh, running, ended up reaching out to me. And at the time, of course, I was still like, you're going to take a climate action. I was still very hard on him, even though he's the climate candidate. And so once he ended up, though, developing this, the most comprehensive climate plan we've ever had, um, I was very excited to see that the Biden administration ended up adopting Jay Inslee's climate plan. And so that was something that myself and a bunch of youth activists really pushed for and got our voices heard in it. And the other example of agency is this upcoming COP26 in Glasgow, um, which is basically where the homework of the Paris Agreement is going to be due for all these countries. Um, the Civil Society Advisory Board um, has, I'm actually on that board and they're reaching out to youth activists because of course we're going to make our voices heard at COP whether they include us or not. So um, having these conversations are so important. And so um, I also want to add that being given agency and um, I've been able to have a voice in a lot of books these past this past year. So All We Can Save, which is actually, I wonder if you can see it, All We Can Save right there. Um, <laughs> Right. is came out this past year and it has a bunch of amazing women in climate and we're sharing our stories and so I was able to have a voice in it as a youth climate activist and as well um, recently I collabed with American Girl who is putting out and I think it's right here too um, Love the Earth and it's basically teaching young people about climate change um, period of teaching young people on climate change and the solutions of it. And so, um, and now, however, I've actually been working on um, my very own futuristic uh, YA fantasy novel because mm -hmm. the youth of today need to hear the voice of their own generation in their fiction. And we also want to hear narratives of hope and change and what our society and planet will look like when our activism is successful. That's great. Yeah, no, and actually, I've uh... The All We Can Save book is something that uh, I think is very exciting. It's all women. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's now a podcast and lots of other things going on around that. So it's great that you're basically creating, enabling your own voice to expand. And it's good that they're paying attention to the climate talks. Way back in 1992 at the Earth Summit, there was a uh, young preteen. Actually, she was 12, I can't remember, um, who gave She's a powerful 12. speech that um, kicked things off. So that's making that even more part of the conversation is essential. Mm -hmm. um, Stan, in the book, there, there's some really good questions coming in here from viewers out there and listeners. I um, thought we could run through some of them. Well, Roman uh, Krasnarek, who's been on the show, he has a book called the, the Good Ancestor, which just came out recently. And he's a he calls himself a public philosopher, which is kind of cool. He, I guess he gets at this. He says, should we be campaigning to grant legal rights to future generations? Oh, he talks about our our children's trust. Maybe, Carolyn, you must know about that legal push as well under U.S. law. Sure. Um, and, and there have been similar sorts of lawsuits uh, around. Um, there are various strands of legal ideas that come into play with the lawsuits that our children's trust has brought. Um, one is that the atmosphere, the sky, is our commons, something that we all share, um, and that they have a right to uh, essentially a stable and, and healthy climate. 
and they jump over some of the legal hurdles around granting rights to future generations by locating that right in existing children. So they are both the face of the future and the present, where they come together. And uh, so uh, I've been working on uh, the legal framework for the rights of future generations with constitutional provisions, statute, which can either uh, uh, reference the constitutional provisions or stand alone, and then legal mechanisms and in institutions that we can create that make this all happen. And we have elements of some of that in existing law. And I just want to say that the national parks are based on some of those same ideas. Um, in the act that created the national parks, it said that they were for present generations to enjoy and to pass on to future generations unimpaired. So we had a standard by which we pass them on unimpaired. And what a lovely idea that we get to enjoy all these things that we share, the commonwealth, the air, the water, our fellow travelers and the wildlife. And then it is our obligation to pass them on to Alexandria and her great grandchildren, unimpaired. What a fabulous idea. And our children's trust has been the legal vanguard in advancing some of these ideas uh, forward. Uh, there were uh, cases brought in multiple states as well as at the federal level. There've been some international suits um, with the same premise. So. Fabulous, fabulous work out there. There's, a, there's Ernesto Eduardo Dobragan is, has been posting some really interesting comments. Um, this one gets at one of the tools that's a big feature in the book, um, financial models and uh, new kinds of currency. And he says, uh, Jordan Hall always remarks the, on the importance of not allowing the markets to rule over the commons. And it sounds like in the book, in a way, um, Stan, you were, you were inventing an economics that is constrained by the commons. Is that a way to put it? it it's one way to put it for sure. And uh, because what we see in history is wherever there was a commons, there is enclosure. So the enclosure is privatization as it's called in the neoliberal time. Uh, whatever was public becomes privatized and that makes it more efficient, et cetera. This kind of neoliberal economic thinking is um, highly destructive to um, the, the basic notion of the commons, which is that there are, um, the biosphere is, is the common uh, heritage and responsibility of, every, of everyone. And I love this that Carolyn brought in about national parks because now this has become a contested notion in the humanities. Is it a, are national parks even a good idea? But passing along the biosphere unimpaired to future generations is surely a good idea. And if the national parks are an early precursor of that, then they are a, a good thing to be defended. Um, so enclosure was so successful in the 18th centuries that you got the revolutions. And I think that democratic government in France and America is the, the virtual commons, is the, the, the re-insistence that the commons was valid and that democracy is, is the idea of the commons when it was a landscape transferred over into the law. And then enclosure began to chip away at it again. This urge to privatize will not go away. And so the commons has to be defended as a concept uh, uh, year by year and law by law. Um, and, and, and the logic of it, you know, we really have been living for 40 years in the logic of neoliberal capitalism. And what I've been insisting on in my book is that we actually need a post-capitalist political economy that values things differently. And that this does get reflected in both law and practice. And it also directs where the money goes and who makes the money and who controls its, its movements so that we all make a living. Right now, I think that profit as currently defined is basically an index of how much the biosphere and people have been exploited. If you can make a profit these days, you have only done it by exploitation of the biosphere and of, of people. So there needs to be another index that is a, a kind of welfare index and everybody has to make a living, but that doesn't have to be rated by profit so much as by welfare. And this will be a different political economy. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm thinking of Alexandria in her old age, living in a different 
post neoliberal capitalist political economy that is going to have to be uh, fought for in 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 this coming century. It will be a day by day and year by year battle, as we see in the news. And I, I guess, sorry, just to, to say that if we saw the commons as the underpinning of the economy, then we would think about it entirely differently. The road out in front of our farm is is a commons, and our farm's value is that road that lets us get our crop back to the market. It's mm -hmm. uh, public water, it's the atmosphere, it's the roads and bridges and the uh, schools and the museums. And if we thought about that as the foundation of the economy and that government's responsibility was to protect the commons, we would do an audit of the commonwealth and mm -hmm. public health, and that we have an obligation to you know, protect it for present generations and pass it on to future generations unimpaired. It's an entirely different view of what government is about and mm -hmm. the relationship of, the gov of government to the economy. Um, you know, then capital can take its place you know, over in, in the back seat. <laughs> so I want to get, we're coming toward the end. And by the way, if any of you can come, go a little longer, let me know if, if we have to cut off hard at, uh, at the hour, let me know that too. Uh, there's a lot of people watching, which is great. Um, I guess this, I'm going to ask the optimism question. Um, and I'm going to, whoops, sorry. I'm going to take us back to Thornton Wilder. Who, I don't know how, how mm. much Stan was a fan, but <laughs> when I read a book like this, it reminds me of, of uh, this book, which was written, you know, in the 40s uh, during the war, I'm pretty sure, a, a play, I mean, the, the Skin of Our Teeth. And essentially he was describing in this play, humanity's history, all, you know, has ice sheets coming and going and and it's a very ugly kind of passageway, passage up, but it seems to be like an upward spiral of progress with lots of warts and bangs and learning along the way. And your book has that feeling because even though it's less utopian perhaps than some of your earlier fiction. It does end with us. I don't want to spoil the spoiler alert. The world doesn't come to an end. Right. <laughs> Aspects of the world come to an end. Uh, and maybe I'll just get a quick round of here of who's uh, feeling optimistic these days, especially with the kick in the ass that we got from the pandemic, which, you know, it's been a horrible experience for so many and it's not stopping yet. And it could worsen even before it gets better. Uh, so what, what do you, when you wake up these days, I'll start with Stan and then Alexandria and then Carolyn. Uh, what's your sense of, of the world? Well, first I want to say that I love that play by Thornton Wilder, The Skin of Our Teeth. Uh, um, everybody should see it. It's semi-forgotten and yet it's quite beautiful. It's a, uh, uh, an allegory, you might say. And the, the production that I saw of it in Boston when I was a young man, um, there are children that are basically um, little baby dinosaurs in the play, which kind of indicates to you how symbolic this play is. But they're always sitting on the floor going, it's cold, it's cold. <laughs> and I, um, in my family, they're so sick of me wandering the house going, it's cold, because they don't really catch the reference. But I love that play. Okay. And as for, um, you know, it's a, it's a matter, it's a moral obligation to stay, um, optimistic. It's not a, a bio, biochemical thing, although it is that too, and you're lucky if you have it. But it's a moral obligation to say that um, what we do now matters and that things could be better rather than worse, which I think is also true. Um, I'm very uh, optimistic about the Paris Agreement's existence as, a, as a, a forum where all these matters can be discussed and that all the nations have signed on to it. And the U.S. never really left, despite our ex-president's ravings. There's no mechanism to leave the Paris Agreement. But in any case, we're back in it fully and enthusiastically. And even though the first round of uh, indexes for improvements in decarbonization were not enough, the framework is there for us to improve the, the standards and the agreement itself. So... Um, if I had proposed that the Paris Agreement existed in a science fiction novel of, say, uh, 2004 or 2000, I would have been um, laughed off as a science fiction writer doing his usual utopian thing. But the real world did that. And that still astonishes me and gives me a great reasons for hope. Go for it, Alexandria. You know, for me, I've definitely had to look for optimism in many places, especially 
um, social distancing. But for me right now, optimism is the climate slate introduced by the Biden administration. Um, because there's people on there like Deb Holland, who is going to be the first Native American leading the Department of the Interior and responsible for all of our shared lands. And so I hope that that signals um, a new relationship between the government and indigenous people. And I've also met with Gina McCarthy, who's going uh, to, who was previously the head of the EPA and she's going to be the climate czar, as well as I'm excited to see her, as well as Michael Regan, who led the largest coal cleanup ever in North Carolina. And so I'm also optimistic about Poot Buttigieg, who I've also met with before. Um, and he gave a platform to me and a couple of other activists. And he's going to be, um, I think he really gets climate and transportation. And so right now there's a lot going on with that. And so a lot of youth activists are paying attention to it to make sure that there's a lot of tangible action that comes from it. But I am very excited about that as well as this upcoming um, year, I think a lot of young people are turning towards the legal actions and lawsuits, as was mentioned earlier. And so even my um, complaint that I'm a part of, so the Children vs. Climate Crisis for a Little Background was launched in September of 2019, and it's where myself, Greta Timberg, and 14 other children filed a complaint to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, stating that five countries, Argentina, Brazil, Germany, Turkey, and France, were violating our rights by their inaction on the climate crisis. And so since then, um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has um, filed our complaint as admissible, saying that, yes, our rights are being violated. And so right now we're waiting for the five countries to respond. And since then, since there are so many other legal actions coming up from young people who are really angry about what's happening. Um, so I'm also filing an intervention in a case that was filed by six Portuguese youth against 33 countries which is before the European Court of Human Rights right now. And this lawsuit also has been accepted by the court and the 33 countries have their first response deadline in February. And so I think that I have a lot of optimism and hope coming from young people actually holding our governments accountable. That's great. Mm. Carolyn? I would, um, I don't traffic in either optimism or hope, um, other than in the way that Václav Havel talks about it, which is that it's the deep orientation of the soul towards what is right. And I think, Stan, you um, describe that in some ways with your description of grace at the end of the book. And so uh, I want to sing the praises of the earth as the last thing that I say today, and that I stand with the earth and all of her species and all of the children and future generations and dedicate this work to uh, rewilding Iowa. There's actually a rewilding Iowa project um, to things like that. And I'm one grain of sand in all of this. And what is part of that Vashlav Havel sense of hope is that there are many, many grains of sand and we don't know where the avalanche will happen. I believe or think that the earth also fights for herself. Um, I have seen situations where the gravel in a fabulous fen in Illinois was too, the gravel was too um, hard for them to mine that rare, rare wetland. And it now protected nature preserve. I could tell you story after story. And so I stand with the earth and with the youth and young people in defending this precious, beautiful earth. I sing the praises of the earth and all who stand with her. That's a beautiful way to start to close things. Um, Stan, you have, you have the last word and then I'm gonna actually play a song. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, a song from one of our earlier shows. I'm trying to incorporate music into these sessions and I think this one is appropriate. So what's your going away message to those who might be interested in the book or just who care about the climate question, Kim Stanley Robinson. Oh, well, thank you for this. I, I feel um, um, amazed and, and full of gratitude for work that uh, Alexandria and Carolyn are doing and, and, and also what they're reporting themselves. I feel like a reporter 
as a novelist, uh, the work is to be like in those 1940s movies, the telephone operators that are plugging in messages between people and, and uh, working rapidly at a board to uh, connect up uh, stories. So, um, and you can't know all the stories, but when you get the sense of the, the, the giant network that's outside of your own little operating room, that it extends out everywhere, it's, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to see. And so uh, I, I, I've tried to convey that in fiction, and I think people still somehow need the novel to, to tell the story at length and in a, in a deep immersive state where you're kind of dreaming it uh, um, in a, a, a work of creative collaboration with the writer. Every reader of a novel is making it up by way of these black marks on the page. So it's a it's a co-creation and very imaginative. The imagination has to be brought to bear and you end up living other lives. You end up living 10,000 lives when you read novels. So um, then you have to go back out into the world and you see it differently and you do the work. So I, it's been uh, um, a wonderful hour here to uh, hear about the other um, uh, speakers' aspects of the work and how they see it from there. You can see the interrelations and the way it's a kind of a, a network. Uh, what I mean, in a way, from what Carolyn was saying, this is a, a, a Teilhard de, de Chardin, the newosphere. So we have the lithosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, and then the newosphere. Well, maybe that's the earth thinking, and um, maybe it's... Um, you know, focused on avoiding the mass extinction event. Uh, and we can we can work on that as we go forward. Well, thank you all for the work you're doing going forward and what you've done so far. Again, a, a marvelously engaging book. I recommend it highly. It's, thank you. Um, hard to find right now, which is a good sign. Um, <laughs> but it's easy to, to find if you're going to wait for it. Now here from a, from a previous webcast, I want to play a song by Reggie Harris, who's a friend who has been on this show many times on the Sunday sessions. And his this was written in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, but it's also part of this movement as well. Here we go. And there he is with uh, Gen Genevieve Gunther, who was a climate activist. We will not rest until the storm is over. We will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. We will not rest till the storm is over. Hey, we will not lay this burden down. Each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. It's been a long, hard journey on a winding road. So many have gone before us. They carried a heavy load, but they went there singing as they made their way. And it's in their footsteps we follow as we work Today we will not rest till the storm is over. Hey, we will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. I know that you're weary. We all feel the pain. The actions of the world will try us all again. But I know there's a better day, and it's coming our way. That's why we're raising our voices as we work today. We will not rest oh, till the storm is over. Yeah, we will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on. We stand all together solid ground all around us there's hatred all around us there's fear violence touches our lives and the message is clear we mourn our martyrs in our hearts they'll stay then we'll sing we shall overcome and go on our way we will not rest until the storm is over, yeah, we will not lay this burden down. Yeah, we will 
teach each other strong. But love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. Till we stand all together on solid ground. Wow. There you go. Wow. It was a very special moment. And uh, this is a very special moment, too. So thank you all for being with us today. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson, Carolyn Raffensperger, and uh, Alexandria Villasenor. Have a good holiday stretch. Uh, let's hope for a better 2020, 2021. And it's the beginning of a new decade here. A uh, crucial one. Let's, let's envision that that 2035 Great Heat event maybe doesn't happen. Right. We can work for that. Thank you again for being here today. And share this, anybody, when you're... When we're done, you can share this live or whatever link you've been watching on it becomes the archive show. This is the last pre-holiday session. I may do one or more, one or two more before New Year's. Uh, not quite sure. It's been a great adventure so far on sustain what? Take care. Stay safe. Connect from a distance. Thank you all. Thank you, and yeah, thank you, Andy. Thank you all. Thank you for listening to Sustain What a production of the Initiative on Communication and Sustainability at Columbia University's Climate School. If you like, send your feedback or ideas for future shows to j.mp slash sustainwhatfeedback. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe and build a better world. Mm -hmm.